Alma, Lethal Poisons, and the Search for Life-Sustaining Planets. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Dr. Karen Oberg, Professor of Astronomy at Harvard University. Welcome, Dr. Oberg. Thank you so much for having me. Tell us a little bit about your experience researching how life-sustaining planets form and how you got your start. Well, how I got started was that I realized in college that I was really good at chemistry, but I thought all the cool questions were in astronomy. And then I had this revelation, thanks to a professor, which was that I could apply my chemical intuition to understanding some of what I thought were the coolest questions in astronomy. And the coolest of them all, I thought, was whether there is life out there and how likely that is, how we can figure out what that likelihood is. Uh, so that's the beginning. And how I do it is that we mainly use this really amazing telescope down in Chile uh, called ALMA, uh, which allows us to study molecules uh, in the material around young stars where planets are currently forming. So that is our main tool to figure out where are the right chemical environments uh, for habitable planets uh, to assemble. How do radio waves electromagnetic radiation of wavelengths longer than light. Tell us about the chemistry of other worlds. Yeah, so, so you're right that ALMA operates at these longer wavelengths, uh, around, around millimeter uh, in size, so pretty long compared to normal visible light. Uh, so when molecules rotate, and molecules can move around, when they rotate, they do so in a quantized way. So they spin up and spin down, uh, in steps. Uh, and when they do, they either absorb or emit uh, a photon, so a package of light, uh, at a specific wavelength or color. Uh, so by looking for these uh, radio waves or photons that are at the exactly right color or wavelength that, cor that correspond to a specific molecule, we can tell if, if, there is, if that molecule is there around the young star we're looking at. So it's really by isolating the photons that we know could only come from a molecule such as hydrogen cyanide, which is one of my favorite molecules to look for. Well, there you go. So cyanide, why is such a notorious poison also a key ingredient for life? And why is ALMA a better tool for finding it? Yeah, hydrogen cyanide, not so great for life once it exists, at least not for most life, not for, for life such as our, ourselves. Um, but some of the reasons that it's so bad for us uh, is that it's extremely reactive. Uh, but that's also one of the reasons why it's so good to get chemistry started in the first place. So if you have no life around, not that many interesting molecules around, what you want to do is really build up uh, those more complex organic molecules as quickly as possible. And that's where hydrogen cyanide comes in. It's just really an excellent starting point to get the chemistry going. Uh, now, ALMA is really good at looking uh, for this molecule because hydrogen cyanide, like other molecules, it spins. Uh, and it spins in steps that perfectly correspond to the kind of wavelengths that ALMA can observe. So, so that's one thing. It's at the right part of the electromagnetic spectrum. That, but what really makes ALMA amazing is that this is a giant telescope that consists of 66 individual telescopes that together makes for a really big telescope. And that allows us to really zoom in on various fine scales uh, around young stars where we're interested in looking for planet forming material and really tell exactly where the hydrogen cyanide is. Not just that it's there, but this is in the right place where we think that planets like the Earth, if an Earth-like planet is forming, could access it. So it's really its resolution that makes it uh, amazing. What is the distance limit for detecting chemicals in space? How far away are we talking? So if you're just talking about detecting something, we can actually go almost to the beginning of the, uh, of the universe. So we are talking billions of light years away. So in other galaxies that are very, very far away. Um, I am, however, not just interested in detecting it, but really figuring out um, where it is and could a planet that's forming access it. And for that, we have to look pretty close nearby because we want to be able to resolve uh, how far away from the star these molecules are. 
So most of the observations we do are of stars that are a few hundred light years away. So on astronomical uh, distance scales uh, in our neighborhood. Are there any systems close enough right now to be good candidates? Yeah, so we have, for the past decade, we have been pursuing sort of 10, uh, 10 ish uh, systems that are said between uh, a couple of hundred to four or five hundred light years away. And we have really been mapping out uh, where the hydrogen cyanide is sitting in these systems. And uh, we already know that these uh, stars are forming planets. Uh, we see these beautiful disks uh, around them, which already have some lanes of material carved out where we think planets are right now, very young planets are orbiting, just sucking up the material uh, in the disk. And that, that's what we're doing right now, is just trying to, with higher and higher resolution, figure out exactly where the hydrogen cyanide is compared to where these planets are forming. What's the next challenge for chemistry and astronomy in the search for sustaining planets? So there are two big challenges, I would say. One is that we're starting to think that planets begin to form earlier than we have assumed so far. So most of these uh, disks of material that we're looking at and that we have been looking at for the past decade are around stars that are a few million years old. And what we're starting to realize is that a lot of planet formation has already happened by then. Uh, so if we really want to get the full picture of the chemistry that becomes incorporated into planets, we need to look at younger and younger systems. And those are more and more difficult uh, to look at because they tend to be obscured by uh, interstellar clouds and other, and for us annoying things, for forming stars and planets, very important things. So that's one challenge to really push back in time and make sure that we, we understand the chemistry as it develops. The other challenge is sort of the opposite one, which is that we know there are planets, uh, we can see these molecules where the planets are forming, uh, but we're still figuring out how to model how much of those mo many of those molecules survive uh, uh, planet formation that land intact on the surface of the planet and therefore participates uh, in this kind of origins of life chemistry that we are hoping is taking place. Dr. Karen Oberg, Professor of Astronomy at Harvard University. Thanks so much for joining us, Karen. If somebody wants to connect with you, maybe they just wanna understand more about your work, how can they do that? So they can go to the uh, website of the Harvard Astronomy Department and find me through there. Uh, and there you will also find my contact details, such as email address. Interesting work. Thanks again, Karen. And find more of my interviews right here or at tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.